Hello, I am Seema and welcome to part 48 and the last part of the chapter Organic Chemistry, Some Basic Principles and Techniques. We were doing the quantitative analysis of organic compounds and in this we have now uh, found out the quantity or found out how we find out the mass percentages of all elements except oxygen. We've identified or we found out how to find out the mass percentages of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, halogens, uh, sulfur, phosphorus. And now we do the out of these, there's only one element left and that is oxygen. If all these elements you find out and uh, like you identified the elements, if you remember, when we did the qualitative analysis, we did not have a test for oxygen. We tested all these other elements. So why did we not test for oxygen is because the only possibility of another element being in an organic compound would be that of, I mean, it would be an atom of oxygen. It would be present in the functional groups, the different functional groups that have oxygen, like the alcoholic functional group, the, the esters, the uh, carboxylic acids. So all functional groups that have oxygen in them, when you carry out the test for the functional group, you would know which, uh, whether oxygen is present or not. Therefore, we do not have a test to identify the presence of oxygen, but when we find out the mass percentages of each of the elements and you make the sum, you find out the sum of all of them, if it does not come out to be 100, whatever percentage is left would be that of oxygen. So one way of finding out the quantity of oxygen would be that you have found out the sum of all the mass percentages and the total is not coming up to 100. So 100 minus the sum of all of those would give you the mass percentage of oxygen. But there is a direct way of finding it also, which is pretty similar to what we've done for other elements. So let us go through what it is. In the case of oxygen, we take a measured mass of the organic compound. So mass M, I've, uh, on purpose I've written that M because that's what we've done for all elements. We take mass M of the organic compound. So we take a fixed mass of the organic compound, let us say it is M, and we decompose it by heating it in a stream of nitrogen. We break down the compound by heating it in a stream of nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is an inert gas. It usually does not react directly with things. So it is, you are kind of uh, decomposing or burning it in a very inert atmosphere. What, is hap what happens as a result of this is that you get a mixture of gaseous products. The compound decomposes into all the gases. And the different gaseous products which would contain oxygen. Now since if oxygen is present in the compound, the, some of the elements would form the oxides as gases. So some of these would contain oxygen. This would be passed, these gases would be passed over red hot coke. Red hot coke is carbon. So it is passed over red hot coke. And when it is passed over red hot coke, the carbon, it gets oxidized, resulting in the formation of carbon monoxide. Once carbon monoxide is formed, so when oxygen is converted into carbon monoxide, this carbon monoxide is then turned into carbon dioxide by passing it through warm iodine pentoxide, I2O5. Where carbon dioxide gets converted into carbon, uh, sorry, carbon monoxide gets converted into carbon dioxide. And from this amount of carbon dioxide, we can find out the amount of oxygen that was present in the compound, right? In every element, this is what we've done. We've converted the element into a, a particular compound. And by finding out the mass of that compound, we find out the mass of that element in m grams of the organic compound. This is similar, only in this case, what are we, which is the compound from which we will be identifying, from which we'll be calculating the mass of oxygen? The compound is carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is formed in two steps. The first is, we first heat up the compound in the presence of nitrogen, and we decompose it in a stream of nitrogen and then pass the oxides that are produced would be and all the gases that are produced would be passed over red hot coke you would get carbon monoxide uh, from from the, the oxygen from all the oxides will be collected and result in the formation of carbon monoxide this carbon monoxide will be converted into carbon dioxide with the help of iodine pentoxide where it oxidizes carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide right so what are the equations and of course iodine would be one of the byproducts 
iodine would also be produced because the oxygen if it is used you'll be left with iodine so let us look at the chemical equations this is the compound and the compound on heating produced oxygen and it gave other gaseous products now when you pass these oxygen and the other products through red hot coke you get carbon monoxide and once you get carbon monoxide the carbon monoxide is then reacted with iodine pentoxide to give you iodine and carbon dioxide now take a look here that there are two moles of carbon monoxide that was produced in the first reaction and in iodine with iodine pentoxide you need five moles of carbon monoxide to react with iodine pentoxide which is not possible how is it possible that you produced two moles of carbon monoxide and you used five moles whatever you use has to be produced so the amount of carbon monoxide produced should be equal to the amount of carbon monoxide used in order to do that what do we do you have two moles here and you have five moles here in order to make them equal you will have to multiply this by five and this by two you cannot multiply multiply individual compounds so you will multiply the entire equation right so that is what we did, that we multiplied this equation by 5 and we multiplied this equation by 2. Now we have 10 moles of carbon monoxide that were produced and 10 moles of carbon monoxide that were used in the next reaction to produce how many? 10 moles of carbon dioxide. From the number of moles of carbon dioxide produced, you can find out the number of moles of oxygen that was produced by the compound. How? What would be the ratio? Take a look again. Whatever was the oxygen that was produced by the compound, that was used up to form the carbon monoxide, which we equaled here. So, if 10 moles of carbon dioxide is produced, how much it, it was produced from how much oxygen which was obtained from the compound? There's a little confusion here, you see, that the carbon dioxide is getting one oxygen from the compound and it is getting one oxygen from the iodine pentoxide which can be a little confusing so you there is no need to get confused you just find out that carbon we will relate these two so we'll say if 10 moles of carbon dioxide is produced it means the compound had how many moles of oxygen it had five moles of oxygen from this you will relate the carbon dioxide and the oxygen Right? From here, you would relate the carbon, the carbon dioxide produced and the oxygen. And that is what we would do. Each mole of oxygen liberated from the compound, each mole that was liberated from the compound will produce OK. So if there is five moles of oxygen, then the number of moles of carbon dioxide produced is 10 moles. So what is the ratio? What is the ratio? This is five. This is 10. So double of it. If there is one mole of oxygen, it means that there would be two moles of carbon dioxide produced. So the ratio is 2 is to 1 for carbon dioxide and oxygen. Two moles of carbon dioxide, one mole of oxygen. Using this ratio, we will find out the mass of oxygen. So we'll say, what is the mass of two moles of carbon dioxide? The mass of one mole of carbon dioxide is 48 grams. Uh, sorry, 44 grams. So two moles would be 88 grams. So 88 grams of carbon dioxide is produced from the oxygen how much oxygen from the compound one molecule that is one mole right two moles and one mole one mole what is the mass of one mole of oxygen one atom of oxygen is 16 so one molecule is 32 or one mole is 32 grams so if you have 88 grams of carbon dioxide produced then the oxygen from the compound was 32 grams you have found the relationship now you can use unitary method to find out the uh, the mass and then the mass percentage. So how do we do that? Let us say that the mass of the organic compound is M and the mass of carbon dioxide produced is equal to M1. That is what we have done in the case of every uh, element that we identified that the mass of the compound that was produced was M1. So we'll say that 88 grams of carbon dioxide is obtained. 88 grams of carbon dioxide is obtained from oxygen of the compound. What was the mass of the oxygen of the compound for 88 grams of carbon dioxide? It was 32 grams. So for one gram, if 
there was one gram of carbon dioxide then it means that the oxygen from the compound would have been 32 upon 88 but the mass of the compound is m uh, of carbon dioxide is m1 therefore m1 grams of carbon dioxide would be uh, produced from oxygen of the compound 32 upon 88 into m1 so this is the mass of oxygen in the compound and how much compound was taken? m grams. So now m grams of the compound has these many grams of oxygen. So from that we'll find out the mass percentage. We'll say m grams of the organic compounds has uh, compound has oxygen 32 upon 88 into m1 grams. So 1 gram will have upon m and 100 grams will have into 100. So from this you will find out the mass percentage. So that is how you would estimate the mass percentage of the compound. Now there is another way how this can be done. You can arrive at the same conclusion by not using carbon dioxide if you know the amount of iodine produced. Even from this you can estimate the oxygen. Although it does not have the oxygen yet you can estimate because the ratio matters. See we said that 5 moles of oxygen produced 10 moles of carbon dioxide. Here we can say that 5 moles of oxygen has produced 2 moles of iodine. So if you could measure the number of moles of iodine or the mass of iodine, from this also you could make a relationship with the oxygen and you could carry out the same method of calculation and find out the uh, mass percentage of oxygen from iodine also. These days, there is an elemental analyzer that is used. We do not, you know, actually uh, carry out all these detailed tests in the laboratory, especially for carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen. You have an analyzer. It's uh, an apparatus that helps you to analyze them with very little quantity of the organic compound. And you identify all three elements that is carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen. It is known as the CHN elemental analyzer which is used nowadays which makes our job easier but mm, the technique or the apparatus or the discussion of it is not um, there at our level of study that is we don't study it here at high school. So with this uh, we understand how do we analyze or how do we find out quantitatively the amount of oxygen. Now let us, one, once again, let me just revise what we uh, did, you know. Where did we start? Um, we started with an organic compound and when we started with the organic compound, what was our aim? Our aim was to find out what the organic compound is. So what were the steps that we did uh, throughout uh, in the past so many videos? The first step was to find out what are the elements that is qualitative analysis was done. We identified the elements present in the compound. After that, we did the quantitative analysis where we identified the, the mass percentages of all of these elements that is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, halogen, sulfur, phosphorus and oxygen. Once you find out the mass percentages, the sum of all of these should be equal to 100. Right? The sum of all of these, let us say this is 100%, then we'll say this is the percentage of one element, this is the percentage of second element, third element, and fourth element, or whatever. And when we find the sum of all of these, let us say all of these come out to be 80%. And the compound is 100%. Then it means that this remaining element which was not identified, what would it be? It would be oxygen. One way to do it is this. And the other way, of course, is to chemically analyze oxygen like we did just now. So you would find out the mass percentages of each element and the sum of all of them should be equal to 100. That means you have identified all elements and you know what your compound consists of. After that, what do you do? You will try to deduce an empirical formula. You will first identify the functional group. Once you identify the functional group, you get a vague idea of how the compound would be like. So you will make an empirical formula and then there are there is a way to find out the molecular mass. So you will find out the molecular mass of the compound and from the empirical formula you will calculate the empirical formula mass. If you divide the molecular mass by empirical formula mass you will get a whole number value n. If you multiply the empirical formula by that value n you, each atom each element you would get the molecular formula. And once you get the exact formula, you would know how to make the structure since you know the functional group. 
So that is how you would go about it and I actually finally identify the uh, compound. It's so interesting and it's really fun beyond the scope of our uh, book of course but that is how we would identify the uh, compound. So that was all about uh, organic analysis and with this I will wind up uh, the video. If you found not only the video the chapter too, if you found it helpful give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye bye for now.